Thank you. So this is Olivia Levine, who you may recognize from the screen. And Olivia also wrote um, the last film, Let Live. Um, we're so glad you're here. Thank you for having me. I'm trying to figure out the right <laughs> mic height. Yeah, let's arrange right that. Can you hear me? Yeah, okay, cool. Just fancy new chairs. Um, I've got so many questions for you. Uh, so why don't we start with the obvious one that every kindergartner is asked when they write their first story. Uh, where did you get your idea? That's a great question. <laughs> um, I grew up going to AA meetings when I was younger um, with a family member of mine. And I think that's just always been a very big part of my life. Um, it's something I th think a lot about in terms of just like how I grew up and how I grew up in relation to substances. Um, and then like my relationship to my mother is also a very large part of my life and is a very wonderful but also deeply complicated part of my life. Um, As with most of us. Yeah, yeah, it's not usually an easy relationship, but um, yeah, so I think I was definitely interested in exploring the complexity of my relationship with my mom, sort of in this context that I find really interesting, um, both emotionally, but I think like physically the setting of a, a meeting space is an interesting place to set a short just because it's like so contained. Um, so I thought that was a cool setting and I kind of went from there. What was it like as a child sitting in AA meetings? Um, some of it I don't remember, some of it I do. I mean, I was, I was telling you earlier, but like I used to go on play dates to AA meetings. Like I would bring my friends and we would bring like Barbies and like play in the hallway. <laughs> um, so sometimes it was just like, yeah, that's where my play date was taking place. Other times it was, I was like in meetings listening to people speak. And sometimes that was scary. You know, sometimes you were like surrounded by people telling really intense stories and that was a lot to process as a young child. Um, other times the experience was really funny. And I think like one thing maybe a lot of folks that have never been exposed to this environment don't know is like AA meetings are really fucking funny. Sorry, is that, That's uh, excuse my language. <laughs> um, uh, but they're really funny and even like in preparation for shooting my director, so I, I wrote it, but, but I had someone else direct it. Um, my director had never been to an AA meeting before and we actually happened to find ourselves, firstly, we went to this church and they asked us to like write down our vaccination status. And um, we were like, oh, that's a little strange. Yeah, sure, we'll do that. And then they were like, the books are over there. Um, and then they were like, are you altos or sopranos? And we're like, oh, well, we're in the wrong place. So <laughs> they directed us to the back of the church. And there we found like an all gay male meeting. So we were also like not in the right place, but we stayed. And it was just like the funniest, it was so funny. And so I think that allowed her to see that that environment can just be but, so but like. But wait, what was funny about it? Um, I don't know, I think. I remember sort of like the prompt at this particular be meeting being like, it was around the holidays and like, what do you feel about the holidays? What does that bring up for you? And a lot of people that are struggling with addiction don't have the best relationships with their families. And a lot of them, like t time has healed that pain and they're really funny about it. So they were just, I mean, the line about like, they say don't talk to your family for 10 years. Like that was from the meeting. You know, people, you learn how to make jokes because it's, it's a coping mechanism, but it's also just like at a certain point, some of this is all funny. And um, so that felt like an important part of the process too, is just incorporating that humor. And how did you meet Erica, who is the director, and how did you work together with her on this? Yeah. Because sometimes writers are not that involved. Is that true with their director? and? The process was super collaborative. Um, we met because we're both just like really gay um, and we were just like, 
you're gay, I'm gay, let's talk. Um, so we were just in a group text thread of queer people and then sort of started hanging out. She asked if I had a project I'd be interested in working on with her, so I brought this to her. And it, and it was very collaborative. Like, I, it was my story, but she gave me really great notes on the first draft. Um, the whole process brought us much closer. So it was super collaborative. I mean, especially because I'm in it, you know, like, I don't know. I, I, I guess had I not been in it, I might not have been as involved. But yeah, it was very collaborative. She's an incredible uh, director and an incredible like creative partner. And we're working together to develop um, the future version of this. So yeah. Oh, we'll get to that in a minute, but yeah, you mentioned, I'll hold you, off on that. <laughs> you mentioned um, in one of the interviews I saw that uh, you really, that this was, all, the whole creative team was women, were women, and you really enjoyed, you said yeah. one of the things that made it so wonderful was working with all women. Yeah, it was like women, mostly women, non-binary folks, maybe like two kind of straggler dudes, but primarily... Two gophers who were getting the coffee, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah, actually, we had to fire one of them, so... Um, but yeah, no, it was an incredible environment. I think it was primarily women, non-binary folks, and a lot of them were queer. I mean, even, like, two... So the woman who plays my mom, Christine Taylor, you know, she's been around for a while acting, has had a great career. Um, and then the woman who plays my girlfriend is a woman named Rosaline Elbe, who is on the show Rami, and she recently was in a Netflix show called Kaleidoscope. Like, she's had some really big jobs. And both of them were just made a point of telling me and my director what a great environment it was. They were so um, thrilled and honestly, like, surprised that it was just such a nurturing, wonderful vibe because, you know, they're on sets that are, like, they do much bigger budget projects. And so I think... How did you get Christine Taylor? Um, we She's got been Christine. on Zoolander, right? Zoolander. Yeah, too. yeah. I mean, yeah. she was in Zoolander, Dodgeball. She's, She's married to Ben Stiller. Um, <laughs> so there's that. But... Um, yeah, arrested, we got arrested her. Arrested Development. Yeah, Arrested, arrested development, development, a bunch of stuff. So um, she's a big name. How did you get her? Yeah, so our casting director, a wonderful woman named um, Charlotte Arnoux, um, used to actually just teach her daughter in an acting class. And so she had Six that Six degrees connection. of separation. Like yeah. However we can get yeah, to exactly. And so we kind of put her on our, our wish list for actors, not thinking that she'd be very receptive, but thinking, you know, at least Charlotte knows her, she'll try and reach out, and she did read the script, and she was super excited about it, and asked for a meeting with us, and immediately it was just like, I'm on board. So that was really, honestly, shocking and, and exciting, and she's the truly the nicest human on earth. Um, Which like, helps. Yeah, wonderful human being, so. Yeah. So oftentimes, shorts are treatments for features. Yeah. Um, not always, but but sometimes, and and a, a feature gives you the opportunity to really flesh out the story. Mm -hmm. So I know you're beginning to work on that. What are you thinking of in terms of fleshing out? Where do you expect you will grow the story? Yeah, um, I, you know, uh, alcoholism will be an element. Um, I think. Again, I'm really interested in sort of this idea of encountering someone you haven't seen in a long time in a in a very confined space, so I think we kind of work from there and wanting to have that moment still. Um, I do stand up, I'm a comedian as well, so I think we're also trying to incorporate an element of that, um, sort of like a stand up is the family business situation, and I don't wanna, I don't wanna give it too much away, but like the feature version sort of um, follows the mother and daughter as they kind of try and reconcile over the course of a, of a, stand-up tour. So a little bit more about the relationship. Yeah, yeah. I mean, have to cross. yeah, I think the feedback we've gotten is all like generally really positive and also I think people are very interested in that relationship and so... Um, we all have one. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> kind of rolling with that a bit. Um, in terms of the short, have you uh, been? Uh, have you applied to other festivals? Is, yeah, you know? yeah. Um, we just had a screening at Montclair Film Festival about two weeks ago. Um, we also showed at a festival in Pennsylvania called the Center Film Festival last week. And then a couple of when you get into Tribeca, the really cool thing is that um, a lot of festivals start to reach out. So we screened at like the queer 
Film Festival in Sydney, Australia. We're going to the Queer Slovak Film Festival. Uh, you know, stuff like that. So, so that's interesting because yeah. although you open this film with your girlfriend, mm -hmm. it's not a story about queers. Yeah. Really, right? Right. It's I mean, a, it is and it isn't, right? Like, it's not explicitly centered on that. And I think, um, I guess that was important to us just in that I think a lot of queer stories are still about coming out, which is fine. I think there's still a lot of room for that, too. I think there's room for any queer story. But I think my director, Eric, and I were also interested in seeing a story that wasn't so explicitly centering the queerness, but it felt just kind of like the backdrop and kind of like an accepted component kind of, of the a, story. Right. Yeah. Just a typical day in people's yeah, lives. Yeah, yeah. And it didn't need to be like, again, I love talking about how gay I am and I aspire <laughs> to make a lot of movies where it's like a lot of gay, gay, gay. But um, <laughs> in this particular one, yeah, it's just kind of like there and that's cool too. Um, what we were talking about this a little bit earlier. What is the message that you really wanted to have come out through the film? Yeah. Because there um, were several and... Yeah, I think like... I was mentioning this to you earlier, but I think for me, one of the most interesting parts of the film, and it's not necessarily something I set out to explore, but um, always kind of lands with me, is I, I think it's a lot... I think it's a movie a lot about how to take care of yourself and what that looks like in the context of addiction and the fact that taking care of yourself sometimes entails like maybe not taking a, a care of another person or is it is it are you taking care of another person when you're taking care of yourself so i think that is sort of a central question for me that i'm very curious about continue continuing to explore in the future version and then i think it's also just about healing and the ways that we heal and um you know, I think that, again, what struck me about when my director and I visited this, a like, went to an open AA meeting, by the way. There are open meetings. You're, like, allowed to go as a non-alcoholic. I'm not sober, by the way. Um, but one of the things that struck me was just, again, sort of, like, the humor component. That's very, he that's healing, you know? Like, you bring that humor into the rooms because it's healing. Um, the community aspect of it all is very healing. Um, and so I think it's it's about these you know, this one woman, but these two women and their and how their healing journeys differ. Um, yeah. Do you think a child can ever really forgive her mother for walking out on her, although she walked out because she had to take care of herself, as you just said? But where do you see that part of the relationship going, or haven't you figured that out yet? Yeah, that's a hard question. I don't know if I know the answer. I... I think you can understand it. I don't know. In some ways, I even wonder if forgiveness is sort of like the, cent the central thing or question there, right? Like, of course, that's natural to be like, do we forgive? But I think that Judy, the mother, like, she did what she had to do to stay sober, and that really hurt her daughter. And... Of course it did. So I don't, I don't think there's an easy answer to that, but I think it's like, I think Liv understands, or there's an iteration of Liv somewhere in that understands. In the longer film. In the longer film. She'll yeah. <laughs> understand. That understands why this person had to do what she did. But it was, you know, that's, it's still hard. Right, so but I the message know. of taking care of yourself is one that we often forget. Right, that we need to take care of ourselves before we can take care of someone else. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, I mean, I'll say, like, I go, I also, starting when I was a teenager, started going to Al-Anon meetings. And for those of you that don't know what Al-Anon is, it's like a group for people who have family members or loved ones in AA. And I think one of the central focuses of that is just, like, the way I like to phrase it is like learning how to orient yourself towards yourself because I think a lot of people that grow up around addicts, alcoholics, learn to sort of orient themselves towards another person or don't even, that's just what they have to start doing. And so I think 
so much of like Al-Anon and so much of I think healing it, when it comes to being around addiction is a lot about learning how to, yeah, put the focus on yourself first because you might not have ever been able to do that before. So, yeah. So it's really fun to sit here with you as a writer. Usually we have directors as guests and yeah. perspective well, <laughs> yeah. is different. And of course, seeing you on, on the screen is terrific as well. Thank you. Um, if you don't mind, I want to segue into some of the other films because I'm yeah. sure our audience would, would love to know sure. your perspective and, and <laughs> may have questions. I sometimes put themes on these evenings and for some reason I, I didn't this time, but after I watched um, many of them, I, I started to notice this theme myself of almost every film was about overcoming some kind of obstacle. And the obstacle that you think it might have been was not necessarily, I think, the obstacle that the filmmaker was, was looking to convey. Mm -hmm. um, so start with yours, for instance. Um, yeah. on, the, on the face of it, it looks like you're trying to overcome your alcoholism, but really it's about your relationship with your mother. So I, I would just love to go through with you, if you don't mind, some of the, the other films and I can yeah. maybe fill the audience in on a couple of um, facts that I, I, I've found, uh, that I learned about the films before we started. So why don't we start at the, with the first one, My Eyes Are Up Here. Great. <laughs> <laughs> um, I actually met the, the, the lead actor in, in the film and she was amazing, um, but again, it, you think it's a love story, but it wasn't really a love story. The love story was the background, right? What, what would you say? Yeah, I mean, I think that. from that one too, I think I was thinking in terms of obstacles just because we talked about me thinking about that beforehand. And it was interesting because I feel like with that film, right, it's sort of front and center is this notion that like her disability and even like the physical wheelchair is sort of an obstacle in terms of being able to like navigate the space around her and their dynamic, but towards the end you realize she sort of has these preconceived notions about like what this dynamic with this man could be and maybe one of the obstacles she's overcoming is her own ideas about how other people perceive her disability. Um, so to me that actually struck me as sort of like, I think the obstacle at the beginning of that film was like, yes the physical disability, but then maybe she started to realize like there were certain things she wasn't accepting about she this guy. She wasn't accepting about him. Yeah, and herself, yeah. Yeah. And that stood out to me. I would, I would, agree, I would definitely agree with that. The, um, the second film, Starling, the animated film, was the winner of best animated uh, film at the Tribeca Film Festival. And um, just a little backstory on that. Um, the director is uh, Turkish. The, f the uh, setting was, I, I believe, supposed to be Istanbul. Mm -hmm. And it was based on having lost a friend when, when she was young. And she really wanted it to take place in, in Turkey. Um, which I enjoyed because I happened to have a Turkish daughter-in-law and the father looked just like her father. <laughs> <laughs> so I got that immediately. Um, but that one might have been a little more straightforward. What do you think? I don't know. I think something that sort of struck me with all of these was the idea that you don't, ne you're not, maybe the obstacle is different, but also like the way you overcome these challenges are perhaps different than you anticipated. So also with the Starling one, I think what sort of struck me was this idea that like, even as this ghost or whatever, like that she would show up in front of her parents and get their attention, but it was sort of like she had to find a different way kind of outside of herself and that ended up being like the wind chime and you know obviously like the go I mean I don't know how to talk about ghost mechanics but like you know she came in the ghost came into contact with the wind chime but it, it sort of just struck me that it was like this some this uh, something outside of her had to get the attention of the parents and she wasn't able she was able to accomplish what she wanted but it wasn't in the way that she expected and I actually thought that was sort of like an overarching theme as well with a lot of these films. Um, so as a writer, do you, do you see those things? Do you see that in the writing as you're looking at other films? You're saying, oh, this is what the writer is trying to accomplish here as opposed to what the director is trying to accomplish? Yeah, I mean, I guess I would like to think, I think somewhat directorially too, just as someone who consumes a lot of films and television, but 
Yeah, I mean, there are definitely things like as a writer you anticipate. Like I loved that last one before Let Live, the Foxes one. I was like, who's going to take the earring out and put it on now? <laughs> like we know that. Um, maybe everyone. But, you know, you start to definitely think like that as a writer, I think. Um, just structurally in terms of what will be brought back, especially with shorts, you have so little time. You know that certain... You understand the significance of certain objects or symbols early on. You're like, well, that, that's going to make a comeback, or it should, if it doesn't, like, yeah. Right. <laughs> so, um, obviously, they're all my favorites, so I w we wouldn't have chosen them, but one of my favorites is the, um, the sperm bank. Mm -hmm. And Rob Skirbo, who was acting in the, in the film, uh, it's his story, mm -hmm. and he's doing very well. We should all be happy to know. And that there were pictures of him at the end. Yeah. And I just love the way he was. they were able to put together the humor for a very difficult subject. Totally. And, um, and that ending, I don't know if you anticipated that ending, but as, yeah. he, as he starts to you know, realize what's really going on and lose it, and the sprinkler hits him in the face. Yeah. Just, um, I, I, for me, that was a wonderful way to end it. Yeah, I, don't I, know. I mean, I think there's so many different ways to like balance humor and drama. You know, I think mine did that in a, a more subtle way. I think with his, what I loved about that was like the moment he starts kind of like feeling sorry for himself, something comes up and makes him remember to laugh, you know? And so I felt like the balance in that film was definitely different and a little bit more jarring, and I loved that about it. I thought it like achieved a balance of humor and drama pretty seamlessly, but a, a little bit more like um, starkly than maybe like my film did. Um, but I thought that was a really great concept. I loved that. <laughs> Um, and then finally, and then we're going to segue back to yours, the uh, Compa film, which takes place in Little Haiti in Miami. I was sitting behind Paul, who was wearing his Miami Beach uh, sweatshirt, and it reminded me. And um, I, I just, um, I know that uh, in Little Haiti, they're really, in Florida, they're really making an effort to maintain the culture of the community. And um, clearly her point was that hey, buddy, you're going to live here. You have to be one of us. You can't just live here. Um, but, and he had to get over, he had to get over a few things. Yeah, to do that. I thought that was a really beautiful, I didn't really see that ending coming, but I thought it was beautiful that, that, that you know, this woman was able to bring him into the, to his world and he sort of overcame his like embarrassment and sh and shame at not knowing this and and was able to then go back to his i don't know father or grandfather yeah, right. and sort of connect with him in a new way i thought that was so beautiful um just what he was able to to bring from that experience to this other experience i also thought just like the visual of him you know, going head to head with the father like they were in the dance scene was really beautiful. Um, I love the cinematography on that. Yeah, yeah, I thought that was shot really nicely. Yeah, I thought it was a great selection of films so, overall. So. so we're going to wrap up. We're going to have a little bit more of a one-two, but there, uh, we do have time for questions. So while uh, Livy and I are wrapping up, if anybody has a question for her um, about that film or anything else, but we're going to need you to go over to the screen and uh, line up at the mic and we'll be with you in one second. Um, so I, to wrap up, what do, how do I want to wrap this up? Um, somebody had asked me what a narrative film is, you know, because I said these are the narratives. And um, I think we do here at Shortcuts have a tendency to choose films that are stories. Um, they tend to be less abstract and have more of a beginning, a middle, and an end. Mm -hmm. And um, I want to say to you um, that your story really had that and had a place to go, and the future in the feature is something that um, we definitely will look forward to. Great. Thank you so much. So, I appreciate that. <laughs> okay. I see somebody wanted to... So just go up to the mic and, and go ahead. Hi, my name is Andra. I thought the whole program was great, and I loved your film, Liv. That was really Thank terrific. You. Um, I have a question about funding. I'm a writer. I just shot a film, short film, and I had to turn my pockets inside out. Sure. Yeah. So <laughs> I wanted to find out what you um, did for your film, or in general, like what you tend to do for funding. Yeah. 
Um, that's a great question, and it's such a big part of it all. Um, I had fundraised for a couple of plays that I had produced um, prior to this and kind of found out that I had a bit of a knack for raising money, mostly just because I like am very persistent and never stop emailing people. And then also like know a good handful of wealthy folks. So basically I just uh, <coughs> tapped into the resources I had and sort of followed the same process I had for those plays. Um, the, I feel like money transparent, transparency is like a really important thing to me. So I'll say the budget for this short, which is, was higher than a lot of the other shorts at Tribeca was $60,000. Um, I was told initially I could make the short for about 25K, um, and I ended up just working with a director who's worked on a lot more commercial projects and wanted that budget to be higher, and I was like, hell no. And then I just kind of, she gradually got me to agree the more um, <laughs> the more you know great cast we got on board and, and whatnot. So anyway, um, in terms of the the process itself, I, I work with like a fiscal sponsor called Fractured Atlas, and I raise money via their platform. So it's a donation. As yeah, so it, it, it renders you, you know, a, a, a nonprofit because of their uh, sponsorship. And um, yeah, the process was pretty much just like asking every person I've ever met for money and then asking over and over again and having very little shame about that. Um, Plus you're a comedian, so did you throw a little humor in there? Yeah, especially when people start to get a little uh, angry. You know, you gotta, you gotta start to joke around a little bit. Uh, I had a dental, assist, uh, dental assistant give me money too, and I, like, she was like, oh my God, you're grinding your teeth so much. And I was like, I'm so <laughs> stressed about raising money. <laughs> And she was like, oh my God, let me help you anyway, I can. <laughs> and she ended up donating and it was so sweet. Um, so yeah, I mean, I guess my answer is like, I am always happy to like even outline the process that I've been through, but I do a lot of like fundraising through the Fractured Atlas platform. Of course, there are other platforms like Indiegogo and Kickstarter and whatnot. And then I'm just like, incredibly persistent. I also applied to a lot of grants. I got one of those. It was the New York uh, State Council of the Arts grant, and that was a $10,000 grant. Um, and that was wonderful to have an extra. So the nonprofit part could really help young film, uh, starting out filmmakers, right? Yeah, I mean, it helps in so far as... Because you can get grants. Yes, you can get them to help you get those grants. Um, and then also like people like tax deductible donations. So that was also helpful. Um, yeah. Can, I, can, can you apply for grants after the film has been shot? Mm -hmm. you know? yeah. yeah, you can apply for post-production grants. Okay. Um, you just, ultimately, I, like any grant you're applying to, I would just look at the criteria for that grant. Um, but there are a lot of post-production grants. Um, and yeah. this is your first film? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great. Great. Yeah. Excellent. Thanks, Andrew. Anybody Thank else you. have any questions yeah, of course. about anything? Uh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. We need to have you go to the mic for filming purposes, I believe. I'll ask a question. Um, you know, you're the writer of the film. You're also starring in it, and it's clearly been shown in different forums. So have you been in a situation where you've watched it with an audience and heard people talk about it? and they just have a different um, view or a different interpretation of like what you had intended? And then how do you kind of like take that in? Yeah, um, <laughs> well, my mom after she saw it was like, <laughs> it needs to be funnier. Um, and I knew she would say that. So I think like the first time I saw it was just by far the most sort of intense dramatic occasion just because like you're so curious what people will think. I wouldn't say that I've had um, an instance of someone just totally getting something out of it that I didn't expect. I would say the, the easiest to track sort of thing is what people find funny. Um, so of the three screenings I've been able to attend, like people generally find different moments funny. Um, there was a laugh tonight on some line that I'd never gotten a laugh on before. <laughs> like, and then the same, the same was the case with the screening at Montclair a couple weeks ago. So I would say that's kind of sort of the easiest thing to track in terms of different responses. Um, 
But I do think it resonates differently with people depending on their background, of course, if you have a relationship to AA or addiction. Um, yeah, no one's been like, I thought that was about, you know, race cars, but like, yeah. yeah. Um, but always, always open to different interpretations, yeah. <laughs> So just a practical question. Is there a limit to how long a short can be in order to be considered a short? Yeah, so I believe the standard length, it, like if you're, it's above 40 minutes, it's no longer a short. Um, the ideal length from my under, what I understand for programming shorts is around 12 minutes because it fits into a program very well. So that's something we were very consciously aiming for. Um, because if you're going 20 minutes or more, even you know 15, it's it just it starts to limit your chances of getting into festivals because that's, of the so length. that's why the films are getting shorter because it's getting harder to find 20 minute films. Yeah, not a lot of those are. Yeah, not a lot of people are making ah, 20 minute films. It's the same thing with short plays. Yeah, yeah. Okay, now I know. Okay, we have time <laughs> for one more question. If anyone has one. Okay, if not, then I'll do the wrap up, which is that the next night of the Shortcuts Festival is on December 14th. It'll be all documentaries, four documentaries. And then the follow up on this program is January 18th, and it'll be a second narrative program. So we hope we'll all see you there. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, everyone.